Hi, Dr. Bob Bianchi, Critical Art Historian here. Today we want to discuss a particular type of vase called a hydria, H-Y-D-R-I-A, uh, from the Greek word hydron, which means basically water. And this was a particular type of vessel <clears throat> that was introduced in the Greek world because there was no plumbing as we know it today. And so the need to collect water for various purposes had to be collected from fountains. <clears throat> and a hadra vase was developed for that purpose. We will look at an example dating to the period 510 to 500 BC in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here we see a vase dated 510, 500 BC, showing women at a fountain collecting water in a hydra. Way of introduction, when you look at any vase, uh, you have to understand that scholars, vase specialists, have described vases in anthropological terms. By that I mean they take parts of the human anatomy as the descriptives for the various component parts of a vessel. So for example, <clears throat> the base is called the foot. The part of the vase with the largest diameter is called the belly. Where the belly slopes in, or it's called the shoulder. The top conical part is called the neck. This is the lip, and inside is the mouth. The analogy is continued, although we don't use the word hand, we use the word handles. So the vessel becomes anthropomorphized or human-like when we describe its various parts. Now, the design of a hydria is very, very particular because it has three handles, and we will look at each of those three handles in turn now. And here we have a detail of the two horizontal handles. And here we have a detail of the vertical strap handle. Now, the vase that we're looking at here is a hydria but it is a specific type. And when this specific type was first discovered in numbers in the suburb of Alexandria called Hadra, and let us look at a map so we know where Hadra is. And here we see Hadra located on a map in Alexandria. And here we see Hadra on a satellite map. So these discoveries gave rise to the name Hadra Hydria. And these Hadra Hydria, which were found in numbers in Alexandria, uh, were characterized by a profusion of floral elements. And let us take a moment to look at each of those floral elements. And now we will come in to look at the profusion of floral elements. We see them on the belly, right here. Wonderful design there. We see them again repeated on the shoulder. And then we see them on the juncture of the shoulder with the neck. A profusion of floral ornaments, which have given rise to the phrase Gerlandomania Alessandrina. So with this profusion of floral elements and the supposed mania of the Alexandrians for flowers, Gerlandomania Alessandrina, these vases were considered to be a cornerstone in the building of Alexandrian art history. Now in the 1980s, when I was preparing for the exhibition Cleopatra's Egypt Age of the Ptolemies, I needed to include one of these vases because they were considered to be an important component of Alexandrian art. And as a result, I did include one that you see here. And in doing the research for this particular entry in the catalog, I came across a very recent article by a colleague of ours 
And he demonstrated that all of these were Alexandrian, and he used the floral elements as the criteria by which he established a chronology, ranging in dates from about 305 to about 200 BC. And I read that, which was the most recent article on the subject, incorporated that into my catalog entry, put that folder aside, and went on to other things. Now, as the deadline for the publication of the catalog was approaching, that very same scholar in the very same journal wrote a follow-up article in which he basically said, whoa, time out, stop, stop, stop. These vases were not made in Alexandria. Whoa. And the proof of the pudding was he had found vases like this that were potted on the island of Crete. And scientific analysis of the fabric, the clay that was used for potting these vases, has been shown to be clay from the island of Crete and not clay from the soil of Egypt. Further research has suggested that these vases may have been made in the pottery center on the island of Crete known as Festos. And let's look at a map to see where Festos is. And here we see a map. Festus to Alexandria is about 400 miles as the crow flies. Now, Festus, as we've seen from the map, is about 400 miles as the crow flies from Alexandria. And the question is, why <clears throat> were the Alexandrians importing these vases from Crete? But the plot thickens, because many of these so-called Alexandrian hadrahydria have Greek inscriptions added to the surface in black ink. And we want to look at two of those examples right now. Now, here you see the inscription. And these are members of the diplomatic corps who have come to Alexandria that have died. This is inscribed for an individual named Hegesias from the island of Chaos. And this is a much longer inscription of the diplomat named Timasius. The vase says that his cremated bones are contained in here. He was from the island of Rhodes. Now, as a discussion of those two examples, uh, there were many more that I could have chosen, a question arises. Why were so many members of the diplomatic corps of the Mediterranean region in general dying in Alexandria? And why were they purposely choosing to be buried in urns that were created in Crete and had to be imported. And those are two questions which still confound archaeologists and critical art historians today. Were these people actually dying? in Alexandria? <clears throat> or perhaps were they dying in their home countries where they were cremated and then they desired to be brought to Alexandria to be buried in these ash urns? And could the motivating factor be that choosing to be buried in Alexandria somehow cultically, magically, religiously linked them to the great Alexander the Great, who was in fact buried and interred in Alexandria during the same period. I let you ponder the imponderable and see you next time.